turn you over to the star of the play called Medina, Roland Harris. Great. Thanks. Appreciate it. I go back to my very beginning. I was a, I was a lawyer, uh, trained um, as an attorney, an attorney in the state of Connecticut still to this day. I did a little bit of criminal law work. I worked in the corporate legal department for a bit, right? But I, I really wasn't finding my way. I, I was always a creative. The reason why I actually went to law school was that I would frequently, I could figure out what you needed to do, but I couldn't tell you how, to, how I got there, right? So what I decided was I couldn't run around telling people what the right answer was if I couldn't give them at least a process for how to think about how I might have gotten to that answer to make the answer actually valid to it, right? So I literally spent three years in law school just learning how to basically develop kind of a pattern of things. You know, how do you explain what it is you're trying to do and why you think it's important? And so that was law school for me. So here I was now, trained as a lawyer, had the, the license and the ability to go out and practice it, but I wasn't enjoying it. I was still a creative. My, my energies were all about, you know, how do you take something that hasn't been done before and make it happen? And if, and if whatever that was could have impact, it was even more important to me. So how was I going to, in fact, make my mark on the world, transform something that was really important? So I had the opportunity to actually interview at IBM. And I interviewed for IBM not thinking I'd ever go to work for IBM because I hadn't done anything in the past related to uh, computers. I really didn't have a computer background. Uh, and when I went through all the different interviews, they had tested things at that time. I, I mean, it was uh, pretty uh, severe in that whole process I see head shaking. Um, you know, I went through it and ultimately had a guy look at me and ask me, uh, you know, why it was that I wanted to work for IBM. And, since I was more practicing interviews for other things I thought I really wanted to do, I looked at him and I said, because I can take your company apart and put it back together again. And I'll never forget the look in the guy's face when I said that. He jumped up, scared the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> ran ran out, of the, out of the room and came back and said, I'm going to offer you the most money you've ever offered anybody to start with IBM. So the decision to get into computers was not one that was all about me having thought through what I wanted to do with my life. It was literally putting myself in a position where I actually found that somebody was offering an awful lot of money to do something I didn't think I had a clue in regards to what I would do about it or why it was important to anybody, but that's how I got in there. And then what I found was it was an extraordinary company, right? Because what I really enjoyed doing was I really enjoyed fixing things. And at a company like IBM, you don't make a reputation for yourself by fixing things. You know, you, don't, you want to stay away from it. Right? And the whole mantra is to, to stay in the center of things and kind of move up the path, the normal path, and have some degree of protection. People who do deal with broken things have broken careers. They don't last very long, right? They get called out because they're doing good things. But that's what I enjoy doing. So what I actually started doing was I started requesting the broken accounts. I wanted the accounts that didn't work, where people couldn't figure out how to get somebody to buy something, and, you know, over a beer or something, I would tell you stories but have you giggle in regards to some of the crazy situations I found myself in. I'll give you one quick one. I actually sold IBM uh, computers to a company that manufactured deck computers. <laughs> <laughs> and when, I, when I came back and told the branch that I had just sold the largest computer system ever sold to that entire uh, company, I mean, I got a standing ovation. The entire branch stood up. They couldn't believe that I actually got there. And, and the way I actually figured out how to do it was I became the personnel manager. Of the, of the CIO. He couldn't manage his own people, so I managed his people for him, but he had to buy something for me in order to do it, right? So, so that was the path that I actually found myself on. And then what happened was, I, I tell people that IBM had really two different approaches to dealing with people. One was the ones that they had kind of found, you know, were all polished up and were going to go to the top and they kind of knew it. And there were people like me that kind of always found their way into the most severe situations. And I called myself a pocket. I was the person that if something was broken, you would dig, they'd dig around and they would say, who do we have that knows how to do this or get themselves out of the situation that was me? And so I found myself getting into more and more interesting situations with higher and higher level people with an IBM because I was constantly fixing broken things. And I loved it. They didn't know how I did it. The other thing that happened was there were no rules. So IBM had tons of rules if they thought they understood the game. But in the way I played the game, there were no rules. So they would just ignore me. It was like, if you don't do anything that constitutes harassment or whatever, right, you know, you just go do what you want. And, and then what would happen is at some point, they would get to the point that they realized that it would work, and it was time for me to move to the next broken thing, 
and they would bring in the normal IBM institution to actually run it. But, but it was extraordinary from my standpoint because I kept developing skills. And because I was being moved around the company, I learned the IBM company life. I could go find money from people who didn't know they had money. I could find resources. So now I was in an environment where the people were unusually skilled. There was money, to, for me, there was money coming out of every crevice in the place because there was always somebody who said, he's the guy that fixed this. And if he can fix this, he can fix that, or he can build this new thing for us. So literally, I created kind of my own internal institution where I was an, inter an entrepreneur within the IBM company, where only a handful of people are actually in that position. I got to the point where I had kind of run out of runway because the things that I liked to do were largely in the sales world. That's where I kind of grew up. And so then I started experimenting. I started telling them I had run to the end of that game. I didn't want to do that game anymore. I wanted to go and now work in their, on the manufacturing side of the house. And again, it was crazy. Roland, you're going to the top. We've got your, your life all planned out. That's not what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do was I wanted to do the unique, the difficult, the impossible. At that point, IBM had built a banking capability where literally it's the only manufacturing site um, that you could go to and it never moved. IBM had decided to invest in something that at the end of the day couldn't sell one of them, right? So you would, the, all automated, it was beautiful, it was great for it, <coughs> but at the end of the day they couldn't sell it. And we ended up selling, you know, Bank One was uh, the bank at the time, we ended up selling Bank One that computer equipment and it started those assembly lines working. So that was another, another chance. Then I, I kind of started, you know, again, working through the ranks. And I got to the point where uh, IBM decided they wanted to go into outsourcing. Well, at that time, you had to, you had to quit, you know, resign from IBM, and you joined a company wholly owned by IBM called ISSC, and you had the ability, therefore, to arguably build this new thing that IBM didn't even know it wanted. And we ended up you know, becoming incredibly uh, capable, so capable that it actually challenged the IBM company, and IBM brought the company back in. So, so that's the path. I mean, that, that, that's where my energies lie. It really wasn't around, you know, you know to some extent, uh, you know, and, and people like that always have a problem with somebody who ultimately is not money focused because it's easier to understand when somebody wants dollars, you know, in return for. I've never been money focused. I've always been challenge focused, and I've always been challenged now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, 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 so that's the energy that brought me through this thing, and ultimately, I got to the point where I had done, I had built, I rebuilt, I had federal business. I could go on and on, right? But that's where my energy lies, where take on an, an important task and figure out how to solve that task, and, and that's where I, I really wanted to spend my time. So, so now, I get to the point that I feel like, you know, I haven't done everything I want to do, and by the way, in the meantime, I used to escape from my every couple of years, and they, they'd find me and bring me back, so I actually built the first computer lane store in Springfield, Massachusetts. I was actually a Wang branch manager for a while, so I kept trying to do entrepreneurial things outside the, the norm. So, so now I'm sitting at the point where I've done 32 years at IBM. I've had a lot of significant jobs. I'm in the top 300 executives in the IBM company. You know, life feeling pretty good, but I'm feeling like I've run out of challenges. You know, what, what is it that I can do next? I've got too much life left to live. I want to go do something different, right? What would that look like? So, you know, there, I had bumped into this company called Exact Cost. And Exact Cost had, as you know, Ed pointed out, an activity-based costing, activity-based management uh, solution. And, um, and it, it, it literally the company, if you think about it, the company was created in 1999. So it, it begs the whole idea of what a startup is. You know, is it a startup if it started in 1999? By the way, $30 million had, in fact, been spent building the product. And it was you know, a couple of you know, folks out of Israel that actually said, the healthcare industry will one day need to worry about cost. And we're going to build the solution that is similar to what the automobile industry did to save itself. We're going to build that solution. We're going to build it on our own nickel. And they will come. And so they started in 1999 building out the solution. And literally until a couple of years ago, it wasn't even a conversation that most healthcare institutions even wanted to have. Right? So in the midst of all that, because I've been watching them, they'd come to me when I was working at IBM. I had conversations with them. I tried to explain to them why what they were trying to do, they weren't orchestrating it appropriately. There were different ways to go after it that would have been a little bit smarter in my estimation. You know, they constantly, yeah, 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 but I really want money. And I said, I, you know, you're barking up the wrong tree. IBM's the wrong place to do it. 
So I, I ultimately left IBM trying to figure out what, what I was going to spend the rest of my life doing. And then I bumped into Ed. Uh, actually, it was, a cra it was a crazy conversation because I had been in Boston just on a lark. Um, Ed found out I was in town. This exact cost company had actually approached them to, to raise additional money. They came to me and said, well, you know us. Explain to Ed you know, what it is we do and why it is, it's important. I said, I'll only explain it to him, but I can also tell him the negatives. And they said, fine. So we went and said, literally sat in Ed, Ed's living room and had a conversation around what was wrong with the company and what, what we needed to do with the company. But in that process, I started thinking to myself, wow, I mean, this, this thing is incredible. The ability to actually get up underneath something as, com as complex as cost in an industry like healthcare that I believe would eventually need what we were, you know, what we were, you know, talking about building, that's big, right? So I, you know, Ed and I had some side conversations, and I agreed I would come back as a consultant and actually work, you know. So I went heads down, and the whole notion of the consulting was to get up underneath whether there was a there there. So one was, did they were they really building a real product, or were we fooling ourselves? Was it likely the market was going to develop? If so, over well, what period of time would the market actually develop? Um, and was there a there there, right? And what I said to him, you know, bless his soul, because it was it was absolutely. I mean, this was before the uh, you know the new healthcare act had been passed. There was no obvious energy to actually push this thing forward. Uh, so you know, I said, to Ed, I think I see the clouds forming in such a way that over the next couple of years, healthcare institutions are going to begin to wrap themselves around the notion of cost, much more so than they have before. I do believe this software has some capability associated with it, but it has weaknesses. So, you know, that's the game if you choose to, to play it. So then he came back to me and he said, well, then why don't you run it? Now, let me, you know, let me give you a, a little bit more background on it, right? So this is a, this is not a startup in your, your most typical, you know, way of thinking. 1999, $30 million has already been spent in building out the product. It's an Israeli company, so it, you know, it, it, a lot of its you know, examples are really Israeli in nature, right? You know, there isn't a lot of buy-in to what it is we're trying to do. And it, it just would go on and on and on in regards to the situation. By the way, I have 120 shareholders. The 120 shareholders have actually kept the company alive out of their own wallets for all these years. So, you know, so imagine the tension when you start trying to address, it's not like starting a startup where it's, it's you and a couple of people and you're talking to each other and maybe Ed visits you occasionally. There's 120 very unhappy people that have put millions of dollars in some cases of their own personal money and wealth into doing what it is you're trying to do. So, so that's kind of the starter kit for the game that I was being asked to potentially play. Then the process, so this is the fun part, the process of actually be, getting the official badge to be allowed to be an entrepreneur is you get a chance to go visit flagship and explain why it is you think you can have a better game and you should actually be allowed to do this, right? For which they then declare, we have never seen anybody come out of a corporation to be successful in their first start. <laughs> 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 right? So if you lack confidence in any way, shape, or form, that's not the meeting you really want to have. Right? And, and what, I, what I will tell you is this, so when, when I looked at IBM, the things I liked about IBM was I liked the quality of the people. I liked the fact that I thought that they, you know, they had assets that were available to me, there was cash available to do what I wanted to do, the reputation was there, I felt good about myself. I mean, one of the things I didn't like about being a lawyer was I didn't like some of the people I had to represent, right? And I just, I just wanted to not ever have to do that. At IBM, I never felt bad about it that day. I never felt like I had to do anything I didn't want to do, right? So I felt good about myself working in that company. And so here I was now facing a situation where I believe this is, this is world transformation. We, this, this system, if it's inadequately installed and understood, could literally change the way healthcare thinks about itself, could actually, like automobiles, produce a higher quality product with greater variety at lower cost. That's huge. So for a guy that doesn't wake up every morning thinking about the cash side of it, but really thinks about what impact could he actually leave behind, for me it was the ultimate game. Now I will tell you, on the other side of the fence, there are things that I assumed were the case about startups that haven't really proven to be what I would have expected, and maybe those are the, these are the few kernels you might actually want to take away with yourself. One is, it's incredibly personal. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, no matter what I did or didn't do at IBM, it never felt like this, 
right? I mean, you, this is tattooed on your body, right? I mean, you literally are responsible for whether people get, get to go to work. And when you get to the point where you're seeing yourself run out of cash, and you're begging everybody and their grandmother for $5 in order to figure out how to get by, but you believe in the idea, and you believe in your people, and you've got people that have even been there before you were there that have put sweat and blood into this thing and somehow believe this idea more so than anything else, and believe it's transformative, I mean, it really has an impact on us, right? It is different from working in a corporation and having a regular chair, and no matter how much I thought I was taking risk and doing unique things for IBM, it's different. It is personal, right? The next thing I will tell you is the quality of people really doesn't vary. The, the, the kind of people you bump into in the entrepreneurial world are high quality people with unbelievable energies. I mean, people that you, you sit next to at a bus stop and would enthrall you for hours over how wonderful their products are and where they're going with it and why it's important, right? I mean, so incredible energy, high quality people of high intellect, right? I, so and I never felt oily around. They're always trying to do something good, right? I mean, you take all these examples. Everything about this is doing something good. They're solving a world problem, right? So I also felt that. The other thing I will tell you is, it was amazing to me because it's somewhat restrictive when you work in a corporation, you just don't know it. The corporations have all these rules in regards to who you can talk to and how you can talk to them and what are the secrets internal within the organization and what can you share on the outside. And it's restrictive. All of a sudden what you realize is, I can talk to anybody. I can literally be one of those people on a park bench turning to somebody saying, what do you do? Have them start talking to me about what they do and go, oh my goodness, it is so related to what I do. And the next thing you know, the energy level's like that. You suddenly find a new partner potentially, right? I mean, the number of times I've even had people who don't have to spend a dime's worth of energy with me realize I'm some standalone guy just trying to get through the day and spend, and spend an hour on the phone having a conversation with me around how I ought to think about my business. And by the way, did I know this contact or that contact? Because they would put me in touch with them. So versus an IBM where there was more of a restrictive policy and it was harder to get around, all of a sudden I find I'm able to get in contact with almost anybody. It's just a number of how many steps, is skipping steps on the water in, my, in between me and getting, getting that contact. So I would never have guessed it. L last week, you know, hopefully you never hear the radio shows because I did a terrible job, but last week I actually got an interview on two internet radio stations. That's not something you get a chance to experience, you know, easily. There are only a handful of people with an IBM that are allowed to do that kind of thing. I was on it. The first one I got rolled, right? I thought to myself, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever that was, I don't want to do that again, right? And then I did another one and I did it better, right? I mean, so the personal development is also unbelievable. I mean, from the standpoint of, you're literally doing this stuff. You have to do this stuff. You have to step up in front of rooms full of people, and you have to be convincing. They've got to want to do or, or go along with the kinds of things that you're doing. And ultimately, just you know, to, to put a line under it, if you actually believe it, and you actually believe it's important that it happened, it's got to be one of the best jobs I've ever had in my life. So you know, I, I guess my job was really to tell you what it feels like to be me. That's what it feels like to be me. So I had 32 fantastic years at IBM. I mean, there wasn't a moment I would have traded for anything. But let me tell you, the last two years of running a company with all the ups and downs and all the turmoil associated with it has been the best two years I've ever spent in my life. So for those of you that are considering such, I would, I would highly recommend it. Thank you.